God was one of us. But more importantly, why would God even want to be one of us? Why would he want to do that? Well, thankfully, Hebrews chapter 4, verses uh, 4, it's, it's chapter 4, I think it says 14, but it's chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, answers this question for us. Now, as you turn there, allow me to read to you Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. We're going to be using the NIV. When we get to chapter 4, I'm going to make a few subtle changes. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. For this reason, Jesus had to make, be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now let's turn over to chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we confess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace boldly, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now, we don't have time this morning to do a full introduction to the book of Hebrews, but understand that it was written to Jews that had professed faith in Jesus Christ, and they're wavering. They're on the brink of turning away from Jesus. They're being persecuted, but they also questioned the validity of this new faith. Where's our daily sacrifices? Is this man, Jesus, really any better? And here's the biggie. Where's our high priest? Now, we've always had a high priest. Well, the author of Hebrews is going to answer that question for us, beginning in chapter 4, verse 14, all the way to chapter 10, verse 18. You'll be glad to know we won't be doing that today. As he unfolds for us his grand theme, the high priesthood of Jesus. Now, the text before us in chapter 4 has been called the heart of the book, because the author tells them that not only do they have a high priest, but they have a great high priest. Now, there's a purposeful redundancy here. In the Greek Old Testament, the high priest was called the great priest. He's called the high priest in the Hebrew Bible. Therefore, Jesus is the great, great priest, or the high, high priest, the priest who is superior to all the other priests who came before him. In the space of these few verses, our author will work out for us the greatness of this great high priest. So let's follow along very closely. And we'll answer the question, what if God was one of us? And I think along the way, we'll also see the heart of Jesus. The greatness of this Jesus that we worship is revealed to us in four ways. Follow along carefully. First of all, the greatness of Jesus is revealed in his supremacy. Jesus is a great high priest. His supremacy is seen on every page of the book of Hebrews. We could not even possibly begin to exhaust that this morning. But let me give you three pointers to his supremacy in chapter 7, if you'll turn over for a few pages. Now, chapter 7 is an important chapter in Hebrews because it unveils for us the wonderful truth that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, these pointers are not going to be up on the screen, so you're going to want to write them down. There are three of them. First of all, the supremacy of Jesus is seen in the path he took to his priesthood. Now, all the others were priests by regulation and ancestry. And when they died, they would be replaced by the same ancestry and, uh, re and regulation. Well, that's not the path that Jesus took. No, he wasn't a Levite. You had to be a Levite to be a priest. He's from the tribe of Judah. So he's disqualified from being a priest. So much for greatness, huh? Well, maybe not. Our author tells us that Jesus comes from a different order. He's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we can't get into all the background here. 
But what we can do is look at what he tells us. He gives us little glimpses. Let's look at verse 16. Jesus is one who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. In other words, on the basis of his eternality. Now, in verses 20 through 21, he tells us that God confirmed his priesthood with an oath, and it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath, but Jesus became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Now, so the path that Jesus followed was his eternality and confirmation from God, not ancestry and regulation. Second, his supremacy is seen in his permanence. Scroll down to chapter 7, verses 23 through 24. His permanence. Now, there have been many of those priests since death presented, uh, prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Now, there were plenty of priests before, and they continued until they died, and then the new one would be appointed, and on and on and on. That line became a crowd. It was like an assembly line of priests. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. He will always be there to hear our cries. You know, the other priest would die, and maybe the guy that replaced him wasn't so hot. Maybe he didn't listen. Maybe he didn't understand. Maybe he didn't treat people gently. But Jesus, because he is eternal, his priesthood is powered by the eternity of God, not the frailty of mortal humanity. If ever there is a priest who will always be there to listen, to understand, to deal gently with us. It's this great, this great high priest, Jesus, isn't it? And here's the wonderful truth. He can never, ever be replaced. He's always there. Third and last, his supremacy is seen in his sacrifice. Scroll down to verse 27. Priests were always giving sacrifices. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered up himself. You know, as a sinless one, Jesus did not need to offer a sacrifice first for his own sin. He was perfect, nor did he need to offer repeated sacrifices. No, he offered himself once for all, not repeatedly, but definitively and finally. The self-sacrifice of Jesus out-sacrifices all the other sacrifices. That is why when he hung on the cross, his last words, it is finished. No more sacrifices. Jesus is great in his supremacy. Now, let's go back to chapter 4 and look in our text. And as, and as we look there, we'll observe the greatness of Jesus is seen in his humanity. Verse 14 tells us that the one who passed through the heavens, who ascended, is Jesus. Now, this is talking about the ascension of Christ, of Jesus, to the right hand of the Father. And the author emphasizes his human name first. Well, so what? Why? Well, because in the book of Hebrews, whenever the author, without exception, wants to emphasize the humanity of Christ, he uses his human name, Jesus. He doesn't say, Christ, the Son of God. He says, Jesus, the Son of God. And his humanity is emphasized alongside his deity. Now, the implications of this are very clear. There is a man in heaven today who understands our weaknesses and our trials. Not a notion, not a scheme, not a phantom, not an angel, but a man. A real man. I think that's wonderful, don't you? You know, 
the greatness of Jesus' priesthood is that in his supremacy, he was yet humanity, meekness and majesty in perfect harmony. We could never relate to God. God could never relate to us. He's transcendent. That means he's above everything. He's eternal. He's infinite. He's holy. He's perfect. He's sinless. Unless, unless God himself stepped down from heaven to be a baby, swaddled in a manger, wiggling those little toes. Yeah. Jesus of Nazareth, our great high priest, one of us, great in his humanity. As we look further at verse 14, another truth emerges, and it is this. The greatness of Jesus is revealed in his divinity, or if you like, in his deity. He is the Son of God. Now, we don't have time this morning to really expand on this and what the book of Hebrews teaches about sonship. It's kind of unique. But understand, let's be clear, that as applied to Jesus, this title means he is absolute God. The one thing that ticked off the religious leaders of Jesus' day more than anything else was his use of this title, claiming to be God incarnate, God in human form. At his trial, they accused, he claims to be the Son of God, making himself equal with God. He's got to die. And what our author does is by taking this full title, Jesus, the Son of God, he's letting us know that our great high priest in heaven is fully human, fully God, in one person, forever, able to meet all my needs, spiritually and physically. Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? This is the foundation of our faith. This is what we believe. Jesus is great in his deity. Now, so far this morning, um, we've been confronted by the supremacy of Jesus, by the humanity of Jesus, and just now by the deity of Jesus. And these are all wonderful truths and we should thank God for these every day. And not only that, we should reflect on these every day. Because this is how we'll grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, how do I live this? How do I see the heart of Jesus? Where do I see the heart of Jesus? Well, to answer these questions, we got to go back into our text. Chapter 4, and look at verses 15 and 16. And we will observe... Lastly, that the greatness of Jesus is revealed in his sympathy. Now, the entire argument of the book of Hebrews from the very beginning to this point has flowed to this great truth. It is here that we see the heart of Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with us, but we have one who has been tempted in all ways that we are yet without sin. Now, the Old Testament taught that God was compassionate. I think it's uh, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. God says, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, full of loving kindness. Remember last week, Randy Daniel showed us the wonderful, loving, compassionate heart of Jesus. But this, this is different. This is sympathy. Our author uses a compound word here. And what he does is he takes this word and he adds a preposition to the front of it, the preposition with. And that makes it to mean to suffer with. It's a rare word only used two times in the New Testament, both times in the book of Hebrews. Here, I think chapter 10, verse 34, where it's translated to suffer together. And it's not simply expressing Sympathy from without. Sympathy from a distance. Oh, poor baby. No. It's describing the feelings of one who enters 
in to our suffering and makes it his own. It's quite literally, Jesus is touched by the feelings of our suffering and weaknesses. See, Jesus doesn't just have sympathy for us. He sympathizes with us. Now, underline that, circle it, highlight it, with us. When we suffer, when you suffer, Jesus suffers with you. Let that truth grab a hold of you. The whole point of this passage is the sheer solidarity that Jesus has with his people. He shares in their experience. God became one of us that he would be one with us. And he does this because he has been tempted in every way that we are. And the idea of this is that in temptation, Jesus was, Jesus was taken to the very edge and then pushed further, tempted in every way that we are. As one with us, Jesus knows what it is to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be rejected, to be falsely accused, to be tortured, to be suffocated, to be hated, to be exhausted, to be abandoned by his friends and God. Wrap your head around this. Jesus, God, knows what it is to be murdered. Tempted in every point as we are. But the author tells us, yet without sin. And the idea there is that he is untouched by sin. It was impossible for him to sin. Now this doesn't make his temptation any less. It makes it even more intense. If you remember, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that when Jesus was tempted, that was a suffering to him, an intense suffering. He suffered being tempted. And because of this, this allows Jesus to care for us in our own personal suffering and crisis. He helps us in our timely need. Now, how does he do that? Well, how nice of our author to show us the way. He gives us two imperatives. Imperatives are just exhortations. They tell us how to take the truth that we learned and now what to do with it, how to live it. Our first imperative is found in verse 14. It says, let us, that's your imperative. Verse 16, our second imperative, let us, well, let us do what? Well, let us do this. In verse 14, let us hold firmly. Because Jesus has ascended into heaven, we are to hold firmly. Well, hold firmly to what? Hold firmly to the faith that we confess. Now, the, this idea of holding firmly is uh, taking a precious possession and holding it tightly. You're not going to let it slip away. You're not going to let it get away from you. Kind of like a, a mother holding tight to her baby. The original readers of the book of Hebrews were in danger of allowing their confession to slip away. They were turning away from Jesus. And the author says, come on now, guys. In light of everything that Jesus has done, hold on to your confession. It's precious. It's wonderful. And by confession of faith, he doesn't mean just the teaching concerning Jesus. Well, that's part of it. That's important. But he's talking about advertising our faith, confessing Christ fearlessly. No, Christians, we have a wonderful story to tell. Why wouldn't we want to tell our neighbors, our friends, family members, our community about Jesus? Hold firmly. Second, then, let us approach boldly. Verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace boldly, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us approach boldly. 
Approach what? Approach the throne of grace. Now, this is obviously talking about prayer. Because Jesus, our great high priest, sympathizes with us. We can come directly to God in confident, frank, and bold prayer. Now, this isn't just talking about feeble prayers. This is talking about the kind of prayers we talked about it a few weeks ago on the book of Revelation. Fervent, prioritized prayer. Fervent, prioritized prayer. The kind of prayers that Jesus prayed when he was here on earth. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 7, gives us an example of it. I'm not going to be able to spend time on that this morning, but take it home and look at it as a homework assignment. You'll see an example of the kind of prayers that I'm talking about. What do we gain when we take prayers such as these before God? Two things. We receive what we don't deserve. Mercy. We find what we sought. Grace. Who here this morning doesn't need mercy? Mercy for my past failures. Mercy for my sin. Who here hesitates to go to somebody and talk to them about it because you're not competent? They'll listen. That person might be unmerciful. If I tell them what I did, will they blast me? Will they hold my sin against me? Will they turn around and walk away? Will they lecture me? I hate that. Will they gossip about me? And we long to tell somebody about our failure. We can't think of a single person that we can talk to. And so we feel hopeless and lonely. Oh, we put on the good face for the day, and we come to church. But our heart is in crisis. There is one you can go to with confidence that he will listen. And that's Jesus, who deals with us gently and mercifully, who listens to us, who sympathizes with our experience. Dear ones, when our tears become our food, day and night, as Psalm 42 says, we do not go to a God who is unable to understand. No. The whole assertion of this passage is not only is it possible for Jesus to sympathize with us, it is impossible for him not to sympathize with us. He will. He must. Hold firmly. Approach boldly. Receive mercy. And finally, find grace. Mercy is received for my past failures. Grace is found for my present and future living. I love the way that the author uses the verbs here. You read your Bible, always look at the verbs. That's a biggie. Mercy is to be received. It's to be taken. Grace is to be sought according to my present necessity in my timely need. You have a timely need this morning? Who here doesn't? I think we all do. You know, you might be an individual here this morning and your life could be an absolute mess, maybe due to failure or sin in your life, or it might have nothing to do with that. It could just simply be that from circumstances beyond your control, Your life is an absolute mess. It's topsy-turvy. You may be a couple in crisis. You may have a crisis in other relationships. Or it may be just you've never come to Jesus, trusting in him, trusting in his finished work on the cross, believing on him, to receive forgiveness and eternal life. Whatever your timely need is. And you may be wondering, is there anyone or anywhere that I can turn to find timely and abundant help. The picture here 
is that you can come directly to the throne of grace, the true mercy seat, not a throne of judgment, not a throne that instills fear, but directly to Jesus, who openly welcomes you and is willing to listen. I want you to know this morning that because of the ascension of Jesus, you can receive help actually and potentially in your timely need. Jesus will welcome you and deal with you gently and patiently. In fact, he tells us in John uh, that um, if anyone comes unto me, I will not turn them away. The idea there is I will not drive them away. There is nothing we have done, nothing you have done that would make Jesus turn you away. There is no need too small or too big that he won't listen to. And this is a universal invitation. This is to believers and non-believers alike. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can come to the throne of grace in your timely need. Oh, the sympathetic heart of Jesus. Always ready to listen. Always ready to empower me to live my Christian life. Always reaching out to anyone who needs mercy and grace, whether it's salvation or to live their life. Now, why would Jesus do this? Well, you see, becoming one of us, Jesus, our great high priest, is forever one with us. And that's a promise. Will you bow in prayer with me? Lord, we thank you so much that you came to earth as a man. You became one of us, that you will be one with us. We thank you that you have opened up access with the throne of grace and that you are there to listen to us and to empower us to live our lives. We just pray that as we go our way throughout the week, we will come daily to the throne of grace. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.